Good morning. Thank you for joining us again. It's good to be here for another Sabbath. You know, part of our, our COVID restrictions are, are keeping some of us away and, and some churches have started to reopen and, and there's a little bit of confusion about that. But you know what? The presence of God is not contained by buildings. The presence of God is contained in community and I love that aspect. This morning we're going to talk about growing and over the next few series, uh, over the next uh, few Sabbaths, we're going to look at the, the concept of growing in God. So please just bow your heads with us and we'll start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you choose to be a part of our communities wherever we are and wherever we are scattered. Lord, we thank you that you are part of our number. And as we open your word this morning, we ask that your presence is here and that your words speak to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Rains. The rains. Everyone's seen the ad. Marge, the rains are here. Now, growing up, that was uh, one of the few TV commercials that I do actually recall. I think it was for McCain's, but I don't, I don't really remember. See, we didn't have TV in our house, but I always thought that was a really funny line. The rains. You see, you can't have food without it. Spring rain. We used to live in the western desert of Western Australia. And I remember one Sabbath afternoon, a group of us went for a drive out to, to a place called Tunnel Hill and just a little bit behind it. And this photo is exactly that. And the rains were coming. And there is something about a spring storm or, a, or that, that, that shift in seasons, the storms that come. And these, these cl rain clouds rolled in by mid-afternoon and it got dark very quickly. And, and this was one of the photos that we took before we ran to the cars and then ran home before we couldn't get out of there. The rain fell and, and in the desert, it immediately floods. But here's the thing. In Old Testament times, there were seasons. There were seasons of good rain. And generally speaking, they were called the former and the latter rain. And they, they came in their time and they were considered blessings. The autumn time, that was the former rain. And, and the spring rain is, is the latter rain. So these, these concepts, this, this picture for me, is kind of like the latter rain falling on the western desert. Something about the spring rain that is really important, and I'm going to repeat this a little bit later, but the spring rain often brought the citrus harvest that was planted and, 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 and done all through the winter. But the main crop of food happened because of this this spring rain, that's when we did our planting for the summer season. That's when everything went into the ground, like our grains and all the, all the things that would be stored for food over the winter time. I want to jump straight through to Proverbs 16, 15. And I think it's a really interesting text and I want to look at the, the concept of both light and rain over the, the course of the series. In the light of a king's face, there is life. In the light of a king's face, there is life. And his favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. So in the light of his face, there is life and his favor brings abundance. Understand that the king that is spoken of here is God himself. Let's keep moving. I'm going to jump into some of the Old Testament prophets and I want you to really go with me because some of these texts are very, very hard and they, they, they are blessing and curse type texts. They, they, they deal with this wrestling. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn and he will come to us as showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. That's a good thing. That's a very good thing. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. But what shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. How committed are you really? This is the question that is being asked. How committed is Judah and Ephraim to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How committed? Because what they are saying is your love is not very strong at all. 
In fact, by lunchtime, as the sun rises, the cloud dissipates. The dew is gone. Therefore, says God, therefore I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth and my judgment goes forth as the light. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets and I have slain them by the words of my mouth and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire, get this, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. This is Hosea chapter 6. But like Adam, they transgressed the covenant and there they dealt faithlessly with me. Let me ask you some questions, some really quick questions. Your church, wherever you are, has had its time of, of, of not being able to meet together here in Australia. Your time of separation. In Victoria, it's still occurring. Here in central Queensland, it's a bit of a mixed bag. There's, there's some serious realities to this. We have to care for our aged people. We have to care for the at-risk and the vulnerable in our community. But let me ask you this, in this time, have we stopped our steadfast love of God? Have we pulled back from our own Bible study? Have we pulled back from our connection, either by phone or by whatever means you, you've been using? Or are you dealing faithlessly with the covenant that God has given you? Rain and light, these two concepts are so important. Growth, growth will only happen when there is both rain and light, but in balance. If you have too much rain, you have a flood. If you have too much light, you have fires. And this is just the way it works. Knowledge and love also need to be in balance. I like Zechariah. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain from the Lord who makes the storm clouds and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation in the field. Zechariah doesn't mince his words either. Ask for, for the rain. He actually gives us the complete permission to go to God and say, I need rain. And believe me when I say this, I do not believe that the rain we are talking about here is simple water from the sky. I, am, I do believe that the rain that is discussed here is indeed the Holy Spirit that is going to fall upon us when we ask for the rain or for the Holy Spirit. For the household gods utter nonsense. The household gods utter nonsense. The diviners see lies and they tell false dreams and they give empty consolation when you ask for rain and you are ready to receive rain when your soil has been planted and ready to receive it you will grow with the rain and the light and here it goes the end of Zechariah therefore the people wander like sheep they are afflicted for lack of a shepherd when there is no prayer when the community does not gather for prayer in some way shape or form there is no shepherd Zechariah, uh, Jeremiah 3.3 3 puts it like this. And this is probably the hardest text that we will read today. Therefore the, spring sh or the, therefore the sa showers have been withheld and the spring rain has not come. You have the, the forehead of a whore and you refuse to be ashamed. This is what happens when we fail in that obligation to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. Because what this is, is a fundamental shift in who we are. And Jeremiah uses such strong language to get his point across. If we don't ask for the rain, we are like sheep without a shepherd. You need to actually know who God is to be able to ask for the Holy Spirit. If you're going to ask for the Holy Spirit, knowledge is not going to be enough. Knowing and loving God is vital. Or you're going to be like the kid lying on the sheep rather than the shepherd leading. B, 
Because what it is, is a vital departure from that first commandment. The first commandment simply says, love the Lord your God, no one else. That's it, put God first. The moment we actually get into the space of all the other things, we actually take God out of priority. The moment that occurs, there is no shepherd because we aren't following the good shepherd. But here it changes. Joel 2.23. This is not the famous text from Joel. It's a little earlier than that. Be glad, O children of Zion. That's good. Everything else wasn't so happy. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. And he has poured out for you an abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. Phew. Lucky. It was pretty hard before. If you take Jeremiah at his word, this is terrible news. To be called such is not to be in the favor of the king. To, to, to be in the Jeremiah world, it's hard language. It's hard-hitting talk that needs to happen from time to time, that needs to call us back to, to who God really is. But here it is. Be glad, O children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. Because He has returned the early and the latter rain. And, and here it gets really interesting. Matthew 28. Jesus actually is talking to his disciples before his ascension. And he says, all authority in heaven, on, on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is phenomenal. All authority. Not just a little bit of it. But all authority has been given. Both in heaven and on earth. And because he has all authority, when he sends us out, when he sends us out, he sends us out with one job. Make disciples. Talk to people about the God that saved you. Ultimately, that's what that is. Go and tell somebody else that God loves them the way he loves you. But let's go one step further because you've got to be making disciples. Go and love that person as God loves you. How does this happen? Acts 1, 13 and 14, very interesting. Now, if you, if you really want to fully comprehend this, I strongly recommend you read all of Acts chapter 1 and 2. Very, very good. 13, verse 13, 1 verse 13 says, and they, were, and they entered, sorry, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas, the son of James, all of these were with one accord. Devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Something really important here. They were instructed to go here. They were instructed to be in this room and to pray together. And they did. And they had one purpose. They had one purpose. This was possibly the most missional aspect of the disciples' life to this point. Now you might say, hang on a second, they, they went off for This probably was the single most missional thing that they could do at this point. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, what I said before was gathering in that upper room was possibly the most missional thing the disciples had ever done to that point because what they were doing with one accord, they were gathering in a smaller group. Okay, it was 120. It was probably a larger, smaller group, but it was a small group in comparison to all of the believers in Jerusalem. Uh, this small group gathered with one purpose and that purpose was to pray for the Holy Spirit. That purpose was to ask God to send the comforter that had been promised. The former rain. Now remember, I said I'd come back to this. The former rain, early rains had a large part of the agricultural cycle. Clearly, if you don't plant and, and harvest around the rain time, you don't often ripen correctly, right? Here's the thing. The, the second one is your main food source. You get a good store of fruit out of your citrus. You get a good store of fruit out of that early rain. But your latter rain gives you the main food source. Mrs. White, in the Australasian record, now called The Record, back in 1901 wrote this. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former rain, and glorious was the result, but the latter rain will be more abundant. That was in our record, 1901. Matthew 5 says it like this, and I want you to really pay attention to how this works. Matthew 5 says it like this, But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. Whew, that's hard some work. If, if we take into account that the Holy Spirit falling on us is important and that we pray for the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers, when we pray for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives as believers, we're actually pray, praying for the Holy Spirit to fall, not just on us, not just on our church, but on our region. Because the rain will fall on the just and the unjust, just so the unjust may hear and believe. The rain falls on the hard soil. The rain falls on the hard soil simply to soften it. I have to go and pick that up. Pray for those. Don't hold this. Don't hold what you have as yours and yours alone. Pray for those. Pray that the Holy Spirit falls not just on you. Pray for those. I love this photo. This photo is of a, uh, an old telephone booth in the middle of a clay pan in Western Australia. And we used to drive past this a fair bit. And the, the telephone booth used to sit there. And I, I said to Donna, I said, one day we're just going to have to go out there and have a look. And we did. And we took some photos. But this telephone booth used to just sit there. I don't know how it got there. I don't know why it was there. I have got no idea about it. But this is what it looks like to have someone standing in a desert. The tele telephone booth is dilapidated and it's falling apart and by the time we left it had actually fallen over and was no more pray for rain that falls on the just and the unjust pray for those pray for the holy spirit to fill you pray for the holy spirit so that when you are filled with the holy spirit who are you going to speak to you see, once this starts to work in your life, once you actually start praying for the Holy Spirit in your life, you're actually going to go and talk to people who need the Holy Spirit. But if you aren't praying for those, the unjust, those who have not been made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, how will they hear it? This is the key. This is how you know it's happening. The raining down of the Holy Spirit 
should bring life to those around you. The raining down of the Holy Spirit should bring life to those around you and should start to build the kingdom of God where you are planted. Small groups. I know a lot of people go, oh, not small groups, I don't like this. Small groups directly asking for the Holy Spirit. Try that. Not, Not actually going into the whole, what resource are we going to, how about just sit down and say, as a group, we are going to fast and pray one day a week And we are simply going to pray for the Holy Spirit. We're going to commit a 12-month period to this. One day a week, for 12 months, we're going to fast and pray for the Holy Spirit as a small group. That small group will hold you accountable to that decision. That small group will become something that is so valuable in your life that you'll never want to give it up. Eating and fasting and, and all of these things, simply for that prayer for the Holy Spirit to fall on you. To fall on your small group fall on your church, to fall on your town. And suddenly you start to see that actually doing this becomes a very missional approach because you're not going to do, you're not going to convert without the Holy Spirit. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. If you thought it was your job to go out and convert the masses, you're wrong. Sorry. It is the job of the Holy Spirit to convert the heart and to convict of sin. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Your job is to love your neighbor as yourself. Once once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can love your neighbor as yourself, but you'll also talk to them, and the Holy Spirit will do the job for you. Freeze you up. How do I know this? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love that text. Small groups. Love our small groups. Here are the critiques. They make clicks. Everybody's going to be stuck in a small click and no one will actually... Really? Fruit of the Spirit? If you're in a small group praying for the Holy Spirit... I don't think the click is going to be the problem. Small groups divide, really. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Not divisive elements. If you're in 10 small groups praying for the Holy Spirit, you will come together in joy, in love, in peace. James K.A. Smith, I I like this guy. He he wrote a book called You Are What You Love, The Spiritual Power of Habit. And he he talks about things like liturgy, repetitive, the things we do over and over and over. For example, never underestimate the formative power of the family supper table, dinner table we might say. This vanishing liturgy is a powerful site of formation. When I was growing up, When I was growing up, the way this was described to me was every morning and every night as a family, we had family worship around the table. My my parents were both chefs. Uh, They they loved their cooking. And every morning we had breakfast and we set the table with a cloth. We, We set out the dining table, which, you know, something we haven't done as a family since I was probably around about 13, 14 and, and it was really interesting because we, we always set it. We set it with the, the plate, everything. We had the, the breakfast cereals on the table. Uh, toast was always made. I've learned to love cold toast because it always was cold by the time I got around to it. And now if you give me hot toast, I think it's just weird. I don't know. But I, this is what I remember. Growing up, that's where we did our family worship. That's where we did our, our daily devotionals as a family. This was our first small group. Then on Sabbath, we would invite people over for lunch. And quite often, people that didn't have anywhere else to go. And mum and dad, because they love to cook, they thought this was the greatest thing in the world. You've got nowhere to go? Come to our place. We've got food. Praise the Lord. And we learnt that this table, despite the fact 
We were not from a wealthy family. We were well fed. Dad used to grow a lot of our own vegetables and, you know, we, we always had a good harvest. So what we, what we saw was this table was the table of grace. It was the table where, where things were done. You could screw up during the week, but you always sat at the same table. You could fall foul of mum and dad, but you always sat at the same table. This was the table of grace. This concept is something that we're losing in our families, something that we're losing in our churches. Forming small groups is a family reality. Small groups that pray for what we are told to pray for specifically, which is the Holy Spirit. These small groups bring healing. These small groups reunite shattered and, and, and fragmented churches. These small groups reunite shattered and fragmented regions across our nation. These small groups bring healing to even the secular nation. And they bring life to those around us. They bring the life of Jesus to those around us. The Spirit wells up in you. You remember the story of Jesus at the, at the well. And, and he says to the woman, give me a drink. And she says, ah. Oh. And finally he says, well, if you knew who was asking, you'd have asked me. And she says, well, you've got nothing to draw from. And he says, the water I have wells up within you. And it's like a spring of living water. This is the latter rain that is promised. This is what is promised to those who believe. This is what is promised to those who ask for. This is what is promised to those who yearn for the return of Jesus. If you go all the way to the end of Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, let the one who desires the water of life without price also join in. Let me tell you, if you really want to understand how we are going to be the remnant and an end time church, it is not going to be because we have such an amazing understanding of prophetic reality, whilst important. It's not going to be because we have knowledge, whilst important. It is going to be because we use knowledge with the love that we have for our Saviour and we pray for the Holy Spirit on a regular basis in a collected, connected and collected community. I challenge you over the next few weeks to find some spiritual partners that you can get together with as a family, number one, and pray for the Holy Spirit to be part of your family. I challenge you to, to find people that, that your family connects with and praise for the Holy Spirit to be part of your church, part of your region, part of your conference, part of your nation. And I pray that as you do this, the Holy Spirit falls upon our region. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask so so very, very mercifully that you forgive us of our sin. Lord, we also ask that what we've read today becomes the truth of our lives. That between the, the grace offered by your son at the cross with his death, death and resurrection, but the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our own lives, in the lives of our families, in the lives of our churches, Lord, we pray that that happens and is a reality in central Queensland that we may bring life to our region. We pray this in the very precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you have a great Sabbath for the rest of it. I really hope you take up the challenge. Thank you.